foundations, logics and structures and Oxford University and a pioneer of categorical quantum mechanics, ZX calculus and quantum natural language processing. He is also the senior uh, scientific advisor for Cambridge quantum computing. Bob's research focuses on the foundations of physics, more specifically uh, category theory and logic, and recently diagrammatic uh, reasoning with application to quantum informatics, quantum gravity, and NPL, NLP. Sorry. He's also one of the founding fathers of the quantum physics and logic, QPL, and the applied category theory conference series, and of the Diamond Open Access Journal composition. Composition, uh, compositionality. Uh, okay. Uh, without, without further ado, uh, Bob, please start. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, uh, so, so actually, recently my state has changed somewhat, and I think the Wikipedia page is a little bit outdated. So, currently, uh, I am a chief scientist at Cambridge Quantum Computing. Uh, given the, the, the audience here, I kind of changed, decided yesterday to change a little bit uh, the, the scope of my talk. Uh, so it will be a little bit more uh, tutorial and, 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 and that than I initially intended. So sort of new title is quantum logic from propositional to compositional. And it will be mainly about the compositional that I will be talking. There will be some new stuff, very fresh stuff at the end, towards the end. And uh, we have particular applications uh, towards quantum tech and future and future AI in mind here. So let me just say something about my. Oh, why aren't you? Okay. So so as as it was said by the by the host, like I, I'm formerly a professor at the University of Oxford, where I was for about twenty years. Uh, so we built a really big group there, uh, at the, which was above people fifty at the end. But lots of the people here actually have. Meanwhile, joined uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing too. That's of course, of course, a sign of the times. That at the moment it seems to be much more fun to be in private sector and in academia if you're doing this sort of stuff. Uh, so now, also even more recently, two weeks ago, Cambridge Quantum, which uh, I joined as chief scientist, we kind of became the biggest quantum computing in the world because we merged with uh, hardware producer Honeywell Quantum Solutions. So, so at the moment in total, we're about plus 300 people. So that exists now, quantum computing companies of plus 300 people. Uh, right, so, so now to make it really confusing, I'm working for Cambridge Quantum Computing, but we are based in Oxford. So this is a team entirely based at Oxford. Uh, some people may, may know Samson Abramsky, also part-time joined CQC recently. And there's a lot of people who are going to show up in my talk today who also have become member of the team. So, okay, let's start with my talk. So, so there is this interesting, so I was going to talk about quantum logic initially a bit more. I'll, I've reduced this a little bit, but I want to start with this von Neumann quote, uh, where he basically you have to lead, especially read the first sentence. I would like to make a confession which may seem immoral. I do not believe absolutely in Hilbert space no more. You have to realize that this was John von Neumann in 1935, three years after he published the book, The Mathematics of Quantum Mechanics, which is still the standard for the formalism. If you read that book, that's actually it's quantum mechanical formalism as it still is today. But he decided in 1933 years later to actually denounce his own formalism. Which, which is a surprising thing. Of course, not surprising. What's not surprising if, if some, uh, somebody like von Neumann said that, that lots of other people stepped in his footsteps. And uh, one of them was uh, Gerrit Birkhoff. So in 1935, with Birkhoff, they actually started the thing which was known as quantum logic, which I now specialize as propositional quantum logic, compositional quantum logic. And you see they made reference in their paper to the fact that logicians were moving from Boolean logic to intuitionistic logic. So they were like kind of giving up excluded middle. And they, they claimed in a quantum logic paper from Norman Birkhoff, well, actually that's not what you should do. What you should go give up is distributive identity. And then a whole uh, program of quantum logic starts. I'm sure uh, John, Hardy, John Harding at this conference may be talking about uh, these things. Uh, let me now say something about uh, something else. Because also in 1935, so I think 1935 is a really important year, 
which may not always be appreciated. So that first there was denouncing the Hilbert space formalism by John von Neumann. And then something which might may be less known by Schrödinger, but which may potentially is one of the most important things he ever done, is actually he, he, he kind of put forward a contrasting view with von Neumann. Von Neumann's quantum logic may, was mainly based on the idea that if you do a measurement, a quantum measurement, then the sort of pro proposition you can test, because he, he was thinking in terms of propositions, don't form a Boolean logic. They form something which he called a quantum logic. Not going to go into detail. You can read about that in, 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 in even some of my old papers, because I used to work in that area uh, in the 90s. And again, John Harding is like dual specialist on, 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 the, on these sort of uh, mathematical structures. Um, so, but it was mainly focused on quantum measurement. So, von Neumann definitely thought, as many people in quantum foundation still do, that quantum me measurement is at the core of the quantum formalism. What makes quantum different than classical is measurement. Schrödinger, in 1935, he said he actually disagreed with that fact. And then he, he starts talking about entanglement. So, this paper is usually credited with, 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 with entanglement. So, when, so, and the main, the main sentence you, you want to read here is that he says, I would not call that one, but rather the characteristic, characteristic trait of quantum mechanics. The, the one that forces its entire department from uh, departure from classical line of thought. And he's talking about what happens if you put two systems together. That's what he's talking about. So he treats like the idea of the tensor product structure as the crucial ingredient of quantum mechanics, not sort of the projector spectra of measurements. So these are two conflicting ideas. Now, why at this point I favor uh, Schrodinger's view? Uh, well, one, one, one reason is that the propositional von Neumann view never found its way into mainstream. I mean, mainstream quantum theory. Uh, it has no current practical uses within the quantum domain. You, you, you won't find it anywhere in practical uses. It does have some, some uses outside of quantum. And uh, I, uh, maybe Dominic Widows is going to talk about that here. I think he's talking later today, Dominic Widows, yes. <clears throat> because even in very early on, like uh, in this millennium, <clears throat> Dominic Widows realized this, that these quantum mechanical structures, <clears throat> especially the propositional ones, are actually very useful in um, natural language processing, which he was do doing at the time, like almost 20 years ago. I'm sure he's going to mention something about that. So, so I'm, I'm recommending his talk. Uh, specifically about this use of quantum logic outside of quantum theory. Now, so that's pretty much all there is to say today about the propositional stuff that is used outside of quantum theory now. Uh, now about a compositional approach, which, uh, which we started uh, less than 20 years ago, I would say. This is now playing quite an important role already, like uh, something like the x calculus, which I will talk about, is now, for example, used in quantum compiler optimization. Very, I mean, in, in actual existing quantum compilers like a ticket, which is produced by CQC, uses the X calculus for its optimization. And uh, soon there will be a book forthcoming by Alex Kissinger and John van der Wettering, which is the X calculus for, uh, for, for quantum uh, compilation, I think is going to be the title. So, because it's now really a very technical area. Uh, also, Kuang Long Wan uh, did work there, and many, many other people have worked on, 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 on this sort of optimization using the X calculus. There's also pra practical error corrections, uh, which was first like proposed by Dominic Horsman and Neil de Boudrap, and then later uh, picked up by Craig Gidney uh, from, from Google Quantum. So that's also something which is now very present, becoming very present in the quantum industry. Uh, another thing is like quantum computing education. So the IBM Kiskitin is very keen on all this compositional stuff like the X-Calculus, and they, they want to make this a, like, like a prime uh, prime actor in, in basically the, the general education of quantum, especially when it goes to educating people at high school level. And we are, I'm going to talk about this if I've got time at the end myself, because I'm also involved in something like that. And then uh, tomorrow we'll be talking about quantum natural language processing on, a, on, on actual quantum computers. And that wouldn't be possible without this sort of compositional logic perspective. It wouldn't be possible. Now, I must say that the first place where this sort of compositional perspective you are pushing was, um, was picked up was in quantum foundations, uh, especially in things like quantum reconstructions, uh, first by Lucian Hardy and also by Julio, who spoke yesterday, and, and, and many others uh, in, in the framework of quantum causality, where we also hear talks about yesterday. Many people are now increasingly using these diagrammatic structures there. Uh, and then also for foil theories, 
initially by Speckens and 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 my and myself, and now many others like they, they are taking these forms of this compositional diagrammatic theory. So in quantum foundations is actually think has been around for more than ten years now, uh, uh, and. One, one, for me, important thing now is that this compositional logic seems to be much more suited for, for um, machine learning. You maybe don't know, or you know that there is like this uh, tension within machine learning, whether the old methods, but which they called good old fashioned AI methods, are actually have any relevance in modern day machine learning AI, uh, because they don't seem to, propositional structures seem to, don't, don't seem to fit very well with the sort of non-Boolean valuations, which we find in machine learning, and distributional, propositional, non-Boolean valuations. Uh, other important aspects are Wittgenstein meaning in context, which is that the context is actually defining the meaning of things, and propositional structures are really, they're not really suited for that. Uh, there's also a lot of top-down reasoning, uh, which I also mention later, and then the physical embodiment, which is also very important in AI, seems to be go very well hand in hand with this compositional reasoning. Okay, let me now say what I'm actually talking about. So, oh, not 2044, sorry about that, 2004. I mean, yeah, okay. Let's hope in 2044, we're still around to tell this story. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the program started in 2004, with a paper with Samson Abramski and myself uh, at Lix. Uh, which is called the Categorical Semantics of Quantum Protocols. And uh, the basic, I mean, I'm now give, going to give a modern version. If you're going to read that paper, you need to know a hell of a lot of category theory to be able to read this, because there was actually very few pictures. In. So over the years, we actually moved away from categorical formulations of compositionality to actually purely diagrammatic ones. So and that's, that's the sort of story I'm going to tell now. So basically, the ingredients of, of our formalism are boxes and wires. So wires. Uh, you think of systems or types or something like that, like for example, a list in a program, and then the boxes or processes like quicksort. So here is an example from computation, but I mean, they're everywhere around us in the world, you know, like cooking, you can think in these terms, you take eggs in, you take bacon in, and you take breakfast out. Now, one important comment I'm making here is I put two lines side by side, eggs and bacon, and that's it. But that, that's what makes this formalism first order compositional formalism, like uh, just putting two wires side by side gives you the connective of composing systems. So this is really uh, following Schrodinger's idea, we need to make uh, composing systems the prime actor in our formalism. And that's, ex that's happening here by putting X and bacon just side by side. So we know how to compose X and bacon. In traditional quantum logic, there was a long time a problem simply taking two propositional structures and composing them in a way such that what comes out corresponds to the Hilbert space composition. So, so this was actually one of the failures of quantum logic. And then of course, with the advent of quantum computing where composing systems is important, a new phenomena like teleportation, this propositional view on, on, on quantum theory kind of completely lost any appeal. Uh, here's another example. So it can pretty much be anything. It, 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 uh, uh, a baby is a process which takes food and love in and produces noise and poo. Uh, and what you can do then with these boxes is actually you can compose them. Like here, I've got like a few boxes. I've got a plug strip, I've got an adapter and a power drill, and I can compose them to make one whole. And you have to think of this composition in the same way as you're working with a group in mathematics, and then you may compose two group elements. This is the same thing. You compose, but the compositional structure is, of course, a little bit more sophisticated since I can, can have multiple outputs, multiple inputs. And uh, these outputs and inputs, these wires, they may have different characters. Like here, you see UK plugs and EU plugs. You, of course, you can't put one into the other. Actually, that turns out to be a lie. I learned like a week ago that there are actually tricks to stick EU, 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 EU plug into a UK socket. It's, it's like a, a life changes once you know that. So this slide is from before I had this realization that somebody actually thought how to do that because it's a trick. Uh, and it's very dangerous, by the way, so you shouldn't do it. Uh, anyway, so you put these things together and then some, and you, might, you can't put the wrong things together. For example, the poo which comes out of the baby, you'd rather not put in your computer because otherwise you're going to need a new computer. I can guarantee you that. Uh, right. So. So, so, th so this is what the story is about: putting boxes and, and 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 wires together. Now, what what does this have to do with quantum theory or anything like that? As you know it, well, I mean, you can think of a state as a box with just one output. It's you produce something, you generate something, 
you prepare something, you can think of an effect or a test as a box with only an input. So you check something and, and, and you think of this effect as sort of the outcome. Yes, we, we observe that thing. It's like a, think of it as an observation, an event. And then we can think of a number as something without inputs and outputs. So actually these theories, these diagrammatic theory, they're, they're as quantitative as you want anything to be quantitative. There's no difference. And to give an, something you know, and I'll uh, make you probably even more familiar with this notion. If you got these states, you rotate them a bit, and then you chop some, some corners off, you actually get a direct get. If you take an effect, you do the same, you get a direct bra. And if you stick in a state and an effect together, you get a bracket. So basically, so basically these diagrams, let me not show this one, they, you have to think of them as a two-dimensional generalization of direct notation, if you want to. But it's actually more general. This is like direct notation is typical for pure states. This thing works as well for mixed states without having to change anything. So, so it's much more general, of course, and it, it's not at all restricted to quantum mechanics, this sort of idea of uh, uh, composing a state with an effect in this case. Right, so now, the, what, what we really need in the case of quantum theory is a special kind of diagrams, which are called, not just by us, but by many people, string diagrams. And a special feature they have is that you see this cup and these cap-shaped wires. So like, like when you look at that single uh, symbol B, so let, let's now agree that these uh, diagrams move from bottom to top. There are reasons to make them move from top to bottom so in certain contexts. There are reasons to make them move from bottom to top in other contexts. Some people let them go from left to right, others from right to left. So it's a complete mess. But okay, in this talk, I hope I've been consistent. They go from they go from bottom to top. They go from bottom to top. Uh, uh, so uh, let me just explain why you want to make them sometimes go from uh, top to bottom. The reason is because uh, we use them also to describe language. And, and of course, in, 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 in Western written language, uh, text goes from top to bottom. So you, you want to make the diagrams follow by the way we write text. On the other hand, in physics, people think more of time going from top to bottom. If you see relativity theory, cones, people think of time to go up. So here, in this case, for me, time goes up. And uh, so basically, what you if you think like that, like you got this thing coming out of G here, this Y, and then it goes back in time. This, you can think of this like actually a time travel loop almost. And then here, two inputs are connected together. What does this mean? Two inputs connect together. Well, you have to think of this as a tangle loop. This is like a bell state. This is, I mean, we write it as a cup-shaped wire, but actually you can think of it as a state, like a triangle with two outputs as well. And it's, it's, it's like the bell state. So you have to think of this as a tanglement. And then dually, if you get like the thing with D, where you connect two outputs, this would be a bell effect. Like the, the cup is a bell state, the wire cup is a bell state, and uh, the dual is a bell effect. And uh, the logic, because there's a logic here, is basically that a wire is a wire. So whatever you can do with a wire is okay. So if you've got a band wire, like, like the one on the left in this cartoon, then you can, you can yank it. And that's, that's, that's your form of logical reasoning, so to say, if you want to. At this level, we're going to see much more sophisticated reasoning later, but this is sort of a basic form of logical reasoning, just yanking a wire or deforming a wire, whatever way you want. Is this an interesting thing? Well, I don't know, like, I mean, I don't know whether you recognize this is this effect, you, you, what you see here, which you learn in, in, in linear algebra. So what you learn in linear, I'm going to give you a few seconds to think which, what this may express. But in linear algebra, you learn something that if you take two linear maps, uh, like F and G, and you compose them in two different orders, you've got F and G and G and F, and then you take the trace, then the trace is the same. So this, call, this is usually called cyclicity of the trace, the property of cyclicity of the trace. So here, this, this, this diagrammatic expression shows that, but what's really interesting about it, it's not even a proper equality. It's actually a tautology, because what I see on the left is actually the same on the right. Why? It has to do with what is the definition of a diagram. The definition of a diagram is what, are the, what is the stuff you see inside the diagram? And in both cases, you see an F and a G box. And another part of the definition of a diagram is how are they connected? And they are connected in the way that the output from F goes to the input of G and that the output of G goes to the input of F in both cases. So they are exactly the same diagram according to our logic. Because we can deform, we can deform these wires however we want and we can replace the boxes however we want, it doesn't matter. 
the connected the connect the connectivity of these two boxes is exactly the same these two diagrams so cyclicity of the trace is a triviality in this formula it's not something you have to prove it's just a, it's a tautology uh, okay here is another sort of diagrammatic notion which which you may know from linear algebra that's the notion of the transpose so how do you diagrammatically express the transpose you take a box you have to look at the right hand side picture now you take a box and you make the output into an input and you make input into an output uh, you can actually what you see on the left hand side is actually a shorthand to notation for it if we instead of actually doing the more complex picture on the right you can actually just take that box and rotate it uh, 180 degrees. Why? Again, this is the logic of these diagrams. If you would think of this box as a physical thing with these two wires like that on the left and you yank them, then it automatically is going to rotate 180 degrees. Right? So, so it's actually again something that's, that's built in, in, in the logic, the idea of the transpose being in, 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 in this way. So, it's like, so all these sort of lin diagrammatic no uh, linear algebraic notes are sort of build building this diagrammatic reasoning. By the way, this diagrammatic reasoning goes back to, to Penrose, not in the context of quantum theory, really, but when he had to work with tensor notation and all that, and he hated it, he was still, he was still a student there. He came up with these boxes and wire notation in that case, which of course take completely different form in, in, in that particular context, if you start to further refine them. But so that's that's kind of the origin. I mean, you cannot basically say that flow charts are the origin of this, which go even much longer back. Uh, right. So can you do useful things with this? I mean, this was the first realization we uh, we had, and we thought that that it's such kind of a worthwhile perspective to actually push these ideas. So so right. Um, so. On the left hand side, you see like uh, two agents. Uh, we call them Alex and Bob because uh, you'll see why 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 I picked the name Alex instead of Alice. Um, so you got one one agent who's got like a state psi, and they share a bell state. So that's this cup shape watch. They share a bell state, and they desire to get that state from Alex to Bob. Now, how do you do that? I mean, teleportation in the Hilbert space formalism took sixty years to be discovered. It took sixty years to be discovered. Now, here, I think everybody can easily come up with the solution. You just stick a wire there. You just stick a wire there. And then you got like, basically, now I've connected the state of Alex at Alex's site with actually Bob's. So just by sticking a wire here, and then, so I'm not sure. And then, of course, I extend a little bit in time the system. So this, this simple trick helps you discover teleportation in a completely trivial fashion, basically. Uh, of course, then, then, you probably know that, that the bell state is not the thing you can impose deterministically. So you've got actually four different bell states, so to say, which make up a, a measurement. But then this one can actually be slid to the other side. And that's actually then the correction Bob has to make. And that's how quantum, and this, this kind of explains quantum teleportation now with the correction. I mean, at that point in time, he was very happy. We were a bit unhappy with something, for example, that you see this indices I, which have to be communicated. That's the bit of communication which comes in in tele quantum teleportation. So that's kind of annoying, but we dealt with that later. In any case, uh, so this was this was 2004, 2005-ish. Uh, now in 2017, we've produced the book, Alex Kissinger and I, that's why he showed up as an agent, um, fixed in quantum process. It, it's, it's, it's pretty thick, it's 900 pages. But it goes well beyond what I just explained. It goes well beyond just like black box, uh, boxes and wires. So it's basically a full course of quantum theory, entirely diagrammatic, plus the explanation how you should think of Hilbert's in over space terms of these diagrams and all that. So, so at Oxford to be, I mean, I, I, I thought this like in 20 hours, the whole book, in 20 hours. So the, 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 the entire thing now, Alex Kissinger is still teaching it at Oxford. Uh, and yes, I mean, we, we teach this between, between 20, 24 hours. It's just so thick because pictures are big, you know, like, like I mean, you can't compress them on the line. Uh, so that, that's the whole point of a picture is that you don't compress them. And what you see the Dodo thinking about, because this, this book now starts to go under the name, the Dodo book is, that's actually a fully formal description of teleportation in that bubble, where uh, everything, also classical communication is now in wires. I'll give a hint on how that works now. So, so the, at the core, at the core of what we did till now were these cups, these bell states. Uh, and that's really not enough. So once, so, so a particular thing about a bell state, this bell state is, is that it has two outputs. We actually will need stuff with more than two outputs. 
I'll explain what they are later. Uh, that's not kind of enough neither. We want not actually multiple inputs and outputs. This is the stuff which now is referred to as spiders, but you can also think of them as multi-wires, a wire with more, with like a wire usually just connect two ends. This thing connect multiple ends and the wire is actually a special case of these things. Uh, then we needed something else, which was phases, uh, which are actually things, once you got these spiders, they exist. They just exist for pure reasons of abstract nonsense. You know, They're, they're just always there. Uh, this phase. I mean, if you see a spider, many spiders have beautiful decorations on their back, right? I mean, just think of it like that. Spiders come with decorations. And then finally, we need spiders of two colors. And this is kind of like complementarity in quantum mechanics that you can have position and momentum. So position, think of these two spiders of two colors as position and momentum or just as two different types of spiders. Uh, anyway, so that's the full blown formalism we needed. And I'm now sort of going to go gradually to the steps. First step is towards spiders. Uh, so there was this paper in 2006 with Dushka Pavlovich, and the key observation there is that you can do quantum, for quantum mechanics without sums. This might sound really weird because, because, because the first thing they teach you in liberal, really algebra is adding things, you know, it's adding things up. And of course, if you, if you look at quantum measurements, I mean, when you specify a measurement, you get superpositions, and, and people would think superpositions are the most important thing in quantum mechanics, of course. Uh, but they are sums. And we, we kind of realize that you can get away without sums. And what, what you use instead is really just the tensor product. So this is kind of a first step in saying, Schrodinger, man, you were right. And sorry for Neumann, your, your focus on the measurements and, and superposition and all, all that may not actually have been the right choice. Maybe you should have focused on how to compose systems because when I compose systems, I can actually recover the idea of summation. And, and that's kind of what happened. And the thing which does that for you are these spiders. Now, in this particular paper, you, you wouldn't find a single explicit spider. We are actually using the axiomatic representation of spider there, which are certain things for, uh, called Frobenius algebras. Now, the, the, the full name is, uh, what was it again? Dagger Special Commutative Frobenius Algebra. So, I mean, not a big surprise that, that the name spiders kind of kicked in rather than that stuff. Uh, right, so what are spiders? Well, spiders are dots with multiple inputs and outputs. And their main, pros, their main uh, property is this one here. That if it takes two, two spiders and you connect them, they fuse together. That's their main property. Now, the way you should think, I told before that the spiders are a generalization of wires. And the way you should think about this fusion in terms of wires is, if I got two pieces of wires, two, two bits of wires, right? One bit and a second bit, and I connect them, then I get one long bit of wires. So if I if I connect wires together, I get another, I get again a wire. So I can plug like several extension leads together and I still just got an extension, right? I mean, the same thing is going on here. If you plug two spiders together, you get again a spider. And that's why to some that's why it's very fair to think of them as multi-wires. And I mean, this is pretty much that's that's there to say about spiders. I mean, there is a, a, a non-trivial theorem about them, a non-trivial theorem about them. And rather than proving it or formulating it, I'm going to sh show you a very nice cartoon. This is a very nice cartoon of a dodo. This is a dodo dressed as a spider. This comes from our book. So, so, so Alex Kissinger drew it. But I mean, I kind of suggested it to draw to him to draw it because I, I thought he's never going to do this. When I wrote this book, I came up with suggestions for cartoon and he drew them. And then I came up with this really crazy suggestion like, okay, draw a dodo dressed as a spider. And he actually did it. Now, why is this uh, connected to the theorem? Basically, the theorem says everything that behaves like a spider is a spider. Uh, and, and not some dodo dressed as a spider. That's kind of the idea of the dodo dressed as a spider. Everything behaves as a spider is a spider. Now let's formulate this in linear algebra terms. If you've got linear maps, if you've got a family of linear maps and they obey this property, so you have to think of the multiple wires as things tensor together, right? You can say, let's take qubits to the, let's take two dimensional Hilbert spaces. We're now going to start tensoring them together. And then each of these wires correspond to, to one qubit in this tensor. If you make this composition, so of, of, of linear maps, uh, which involves both like taking uh, chronic products and composing matrices and all that. So if you make this composition on the left, which is somewhat complicated to even express in linear algebra, but if you do that, and you get the one on the right, so you've got a family of linear maps representing spiders, then they necessarily are of this form. They necessarily are of this form. 
And that's how you formally define spiders in linear algebra. You basically take a basis and you form this thing. You, form, you take a basis and you form these things. That thing, so this you have to think about as brass. This you have to think about as cats. So you take a bunch of cats together, you take a bunch of brass together, you sum over the different basis vectors, and that's how you define a spider. And so the theorem says that anything that composes like a spider in, 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 in uh, Hilbert space must be of this form for some basis. So there can be different families because there are different bases. So ultimately what it is saying is that these spiders, they capture the concept of an orthonormal basis in Hilbert space. And that's how you get rid of stones. Because in many cases, like you, when you express a superposition, you make a superposition over the basis. And then this spider is actually capturing that notion of making superpositions over the basis. So two examples of spiders are a copy spider, like this one, or a delete spider. So they, they do exactly all the bases do what you do. But then if you know the no cloning theorem, then you know that if you got that if you got anything that acts like a copy, then it actually defines a basis, then it can only be copying of the basis elements. And then so, so that actually just that's actually gives you a little bit more intuition why the spiders capture the basis. Okay, now okay, that's nice. The spider, so what the spiders enabled us to do, I, I, I did give an example here, is but, but express classical communication in teleportation. It, it was able to express like classical versus quantum information flows. So you, you could have a different notation now for uh, I'll show a picture later about when you got classical data and when you got classic quantum data like in the teleportation protocol. But we were more ambitious. We wanted to really get rid of any connection with linear algebra at all. And uh, we want and to achieve this, I mean, we knew we needed something like complementary observables. So, so in this paper from 2008 with Ross Duncan, uh, we introduced what is now called the ZX calculus. We didn't give it that name at the time. We were really looking for a conceptual description of complementarity in terms of the tensor product, in terms of the spiders, essentially. And uh, that's what we did in this paper, but then later it became sort of, so there was a discussion recently, nobody really remembers when it was called the x calculus. Uh, uh, but yeah. Uh, okay, so the first concept we introduced was the notion of a phase. And basically, uh, these phases, I can't go into too much detail. I mean, that's all expre expressed, in a lot, expressed in a lot of detail in our book. But uh, you have to think of these phases as the stuff that doesn't survive the passage to the classical world. So basically, how do you express classicality in these things? By, by, by actually introducing quantumness. How do you introduce quantumness? We basically double the wires. So if it, if you, you just double everything. That's exactly what, what you do when you go to density matrix, you know? If you got a pure state and you want to build a density matrix, you take a, bread, a cat and a bra together. So you take two things together and you do the same thing here. You just double your wires. And we represent this here by the stick wires. So they are doubled wires. Uh, and then when you go actually, via, this is actually something like the copy spider. Well, the opposite, it's sort of the, the mute, the, the merge spider. If you then merge two things into one, that's, that's like decoherence. You have to think of that uh, as decoherence. And phases are the stuff which get erased by decoherence. So phases are pure quantum stuff, pure in the sense of, um, of usual pure, they, they are authentic quantum stuff that doesn't survive the passage to the classical world. That's what phases are, that's how we define them, implicitly in this diagram. And then, uh, the X calculus arises when you take two families of spiders with these phases. So you got the white spiders here and the gray spiders there. Uh, we used to write them in green and red because the, I only had two pens at the time in my office, a red and a green pen. And uh, but then then the publishers didn't want to do color, so we convert to white and 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 gray. And also, as it turns out, red and green are the most common cases of color, color, color blindness. So, so it was a pretty bad choice we made there. But anyway, so this is the X calculus. You, you have these two spiders with decorations with fuse, the gray and the red ones. Then you've got this very spe special equation here. I mean, there's a lot to say about that. I can't go into details here, which sometimes is called the bi-algebra equation. Uh, so basically, these are, this, is, this defines white spiders. This defines gray spiders. This tells us how the two interact with each other, what happens if the two spiders meet. And this is something which has to do, because at the moment we haven't said anything about dimension. This is actually some, something that defines the two dimensionality of, uh, of, 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 uh, of qubits and all that. It basically tells us 
that if you go to the next observable, which is which are the gray uh, the gray spiders, if you go to y uh, z observable, which are supposed to be the white spiders, then you can define the y uh, the y observable in two different ways. Starting and this is like rotating from the top of the block sphere or the equator of the block sphere into into the y observable. So you got two ways of rotating, and that's what that Ford equation says. And remarkably. You can prove so much stuff just with these equations, which usually use matrices for. Uh, okay, so I want to give you an example of once you got these rules at hand, something you can prove. This is the proof of non-locality of quantum mechanics. This is the full, full proof of, of non-locality of quantum mechanics. And you don't need any words. It's pure equations. Like if you look at the usual proofs, there's a lot of words and stuff like that. This is full proof. So basically what you got here is each of these four chunks here they, they constitute one of the four Merman scenarios, the sort of four possible choices of, of Merman scenarios. This is the GHZ step at the bottom. Then you do some rotation. Then you do a measurement going from thick to thin. And then you do a parity check. Then you do a parity check. Then you basically use this equation. I mean, I can't, if, 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 if can't, first you fuse these things together, then you use this equation. And this gets you here. And then you fuse again and you get a pi. This is the expression of the existence of local hidden variables, which are expressed here as classical things, because they're they single, local hidden variables. Then you use your equations, and then you see that you get a contradiction, which means this Merman scenario can never be exp explained with local hidden variables. So this is the full proof of quantum non-locality in these diagrammatic terms. Uh, now, what, what's really, I mean, we of course knew already quantum non-locality, and we knew that the Merman proof before. It was just a very elegant presentation, this one. Uh, but, but where the really new stuff started to come out of this diagrammatic calculus is, is when you start to really look at quantum computing and, and, and circuits and things like that. So basically, the CNOT gate, which is, of course, one of the key ingredients in quantum computing, arises by fusing a white, by actually connecting a white spider and a gray spider together. So, so, that's, so that's one way to think of these spiders. They're like the two chunks of a CNOT gate. There are two chunks of a CNOT gate. So now we've got the CNOT gate breaking down in two pieces. And we understand these little pieces very well. So what happened, what's, what's been the result of that? And there's many, many papers about it now. I said some names like uh, Alex Kissinger, Jean van der Wettering, I think Ross Duncan has some, Kwan Long Wong, Neil de Baudrap. So, so basically what you do is like you take a quantum circuit, you break the xenon gates down in little pieces, you play, replace your phase gates with these phase spiders, because that's what they are. And then you can start doing lots of stuff which you can, can't, cannot do at the circuit level. Circuit level, sometimes it looks like I can't do anything here. But when you do this reduction to chunks, suddenly you can compute a lot more. And you can start to fuse many things together. And you can actually compress the circuit a lot and, 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 and make a small circuit. Why is this important? Quantum computers at the moment are quite small. So, so if, if you need to, so for example, a lot of the IBM devices, the, 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 they, they get into trouble if you layer more than three CNOT gates on top of each other. So the depth of the circuit higher than three becomes problematic in terms of noise. So you really want to sort of possibly like sequence, uh, parallelize or reduce your circuit as much as you can. It's a very important thing. And it's now something that's, for example, building the ticket compiler, which in fact, the ticket compiler development is led, led by Ross Duncan, who, who, who came up with this ZX calculus with me in 2008. He's like leading the development. And this, this thing is now at the heart of like a, the ticket compiler, uh, this diagrammatic stuff. And that's actually why it's so good. Uh, so I mean, so, so we're now talking very practical stuff based on these diagrams. Uh, like I said already, there, there, I, think, I know there's a long article by John van der Wettering now on the archive. It explains practical uses of ZX calculus in this sort of quantum computing. And there's a book for coming by John van der Wettering and Alex Kissinger about it. OK, so, the, so, so this is about the practical stuff. Currently in quantum computing, of uh, I mean, there is a lot more. There's actually a paper which, which lists a lot of things, which you may not read. It's called, uh, it's called Kindergarten Quantum Mechanics Graduates. And an old paper in 9205, Kindergarten Quantum Mechanics, where I introduced these boxes and wires for quantum computing. But uh, now we call it Kindergarten Quantum Mechanics gra Graduates, and we give a number of very practical applications of this diagrammatic reasoning, which were not possible without, so to say. Uh, right. Okay. Now back to logic, because because uh, there, there was a, there was supposed to be a big uh, component of this talk, which was about which was about uh, logic. So 
you want to ask the so, so why did we introduce the x count? So we introduced the x count was because we wanted to sort of replace Hilbert space matrix reasoning to as much as possible. And then you could ideologically ask, can we uh, can we get rid of it altogether? Can we come up with diagrams that that completely uh, that allow you to do all equational reasoning that you usually do with matrices? Can we come up with that? So a first result from 2008 by Peter Selinger, who will be speaking at the conference too, was that for string diagrams, for so so that an equational statement that you can prove with string diagrams holds even on even on if it's provable with the open spaces. So, but it, there is a big caveat here because the string diagrams, I'm not talking about the X now, talking about the, so the wires and the boxes just, they are not fully expressive at all. Can, there's only so much things we can express. I mean, we showed some examples like simplicity of the trace as equations. There's so much you can express, but at least for everything that's expressible, if you can prove it in Hilbert space, you can prove it with the diagrams. So that was kind of an encouraging thing. It was a kind of an encouraging thing, but it was not at all uh, uh, towards everything. Now, the ZX calculus has the property of being universal, which means I can write every matrix as a ZX diagram. I can do that. So it's universal. So if we can get completeness for ZX calculus, which is a universal language, then we know that every equation you can establish with matrices, you can also do with diagrams. Uh, so the first, the first result there uh, for the X calculus was by Miriam Buggins uh, in 2012. And she said that for the stabilizer restriction of quantum mechanics, you can prove everything diagrammatically. This mean, stabilizer uh, restriction means you only have to take the, the X, Y, X, the Z, X, and Y eigenstates, and you, you build a theory around that, tensor product and all that, that's a stabilizer. Well, that's actually all you need to prove, for example, non-locality. So it's, it's already a rich fragment. And Miriam proved completeness for that. Then there was a whole bunch of results, a lot of match driven by Amar, some, some by a team in, in, in Nancy, with Simone Pondrix and, and Renaud Vimar and Manuel Girondel. But then the, the full blown completeness, first result, because even that continued, like simplifying it, was shown by uh, two former students, uh, Kang Feng and, and, and Kuang Long, uh, and mainly based on work by Amar Adzina. Azia Salovich, also a former student of me. So at that point, it was proven that equational reasoning in Hilbert space can be completely substituted by diagrammatic reasoning. More work, especially also by the French team, then simplified the, the form that the diagrams take, because you do have to add, so this is not enough. But the state now is that you have to add one more equation. You have to add one more equation to do everything diagrammatically. And it's a fairly intuitive one. So that's now the status. Um, okay. So I'll show the picture of the book because actually the book came out before completeness was proved. And so it's stated there as an open problem. So, so I should say that. Uh, right. Now I want to tell, so what is this all about? Like, I'm, I mean, what is the logical paradox? So basically these diagrams are a reasoning system. And I say they are a valid su substitute for usual propositional logical reasoning. That's my claim. So we get completeness theorems, which are typical in, in, in for logical formalism. How expressive are your logical axioms? What can you prove with respect to a model? That's some, something people do in model theory. So that's where this term completeness comes from. In model theory, one would call things like conservative extension or something like that. So, so I'm now going to try to express how I think logically about these diagrams. And I'm going to start with uh, the, the notion of linguistic compositionality, which goes back to Frege. So linguistic compositionality says that the meaning of a whole, like a sentence, should only depend on the meanings of its parts, like words, and how they are structured. In, this, in the case of language, we, this would be the grammar. You take a bunch of words, you take their grammar, they form a sentence, and then from the meaning of the words, uh, you can, co you can uh, extract the meaning of a sentence, provided you also know the grammar. I mean, that's, that's, that's a very, 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 very reasonable thing because otherwise we would never understand sentences we never hear before and typically we do. So it's a, it's a, it's a powerful concept, but there are a bunch of problems with it. For example, some linguistic meanings are induced by the context. So if I'm talking about Alice, and then, then the only way you can distinguish Alice from, from Wonderland and Alice from Alice and Bob or something like that is by the broader context. And I can tell you a sentence easily about Alice, about Alice, Alice in Wonderland, which could also be about uh, Alice, like uh, in Alice and Bob. And the only way you can actually deduce which one of the two it was 
is the person who said it. Maybe it's a, it, it, it's a kid who just read out his own versus a security express expert who's in the center saying all this stuff. So you need this context even sometimes of who is speaking to know what you're saying. Uh, it can be, okay, so that's a problem with this like bottom-up thinking like if I know the meaning of the parts, I know the meaning of the whole, because here this wouldn't work. It gets much worse. Like here is an example, black metal fan. I don't, for those who don't know, black metal is, is a music genre. So black metal fan can be two, two completely different things. Okay, so before we had this case of ambiguity of Alice, but here the ambiguity is much worse because in, or if I take black metal fan as in the left picture or black metal fan as in the right picture, they're actually grammatically different. The grammar of these two expressions is not the same. Uh, I mean, so I mean, you'll hear more about this tomorrow, but you can express grammar exactly in the same diagrams as, as, as I was using for quantum. But uh, so, so in the case of the, 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 the fan of the music genre black metal, you first form black metal as a whole, and then you apply it as an adjective to fan. So you can sort of intuitively see how I did this in the pictures. I mean, we have a formal way to, to justify these pictures, of course. While in the second, while in the second case, you say first, I've got a metal fan, and then it's, it happens to be black too, it's just an ordering of two adjectives. While in, on the left, you actually form an adjective as a whole, and then you apply the fan on the right, you just have two, two nested adjectives. So they're grammatically different. And the only way you can know which grammar you have to apply is by knowing the broader context of where, where this, this phrase black metal fan is used. So, so the idea which you see above, that from the part, from these two different things, meanings, and grammar together, you get a whole, doesn't make sense here anymore because you don't, the grammar doesn't even make sense without knowing the whole meaning for which you actually probably need some additional context. Right. Uh, now, in quantum mechanics, it becomes even worse. And this is the point where actually I'm, I, I do a diagram from top to bottom. Sorry about that. Is that now, if you take something like the Bell state and you want to think of the Bell state in terms of Frege's terms, uh, so, okay, you take the reduced states. What are the reduced states of the Bell state? They're the maximum limit state. What do you need? So what, the, what do you need to specify in addition to the two maximum limit states, one for A and one for B, in order to deduce, deduce that you got the Bell state? Well, the Bell state itself. You need the full specification of the Bell state when you know the parts in order to describe the whole. So then this compositionality principle above just doesn't make any sense anymore because you basically need the, 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 the way they are structured is actually the, the whole itself. So, so, so that's why people sometimes say this is like all holistic and, and that's what it is. So that compositionality principle doesn't make sense. But as far as I'm concerned, the whole thing I've been talking about to you this talk was compositionality. So how do we define that thing? And it, it's only really the last couple of days or maybe a week or two weeks I've been seriously thinking about this. Um, and the way I, and that's that's what I'll do now. I'll, I'll try to put forward a definition of compositionality, which is new and which 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 actually fits completely this quantum stuff. Uh, so basically, we have a process theory, which is really what I've been talking about all the time. You got systems represented by wires. You got processes represented by boxes. Which systems and inputs and outputs. We got composition of processes that are represented by wirings, and they of course have to follow process again. You can go much more general, like the stuff like uh, Ogni and, and, and Julio talked a lot about, like these higher order processes, what they call process matrices. You can think of as a process which transforms a process, which makes perfect sense, perfectly. So you can actually extend this notion of process theory if you want to higher order processes. Um, so so that, that's, that's what we think is an essential part of the process theory. Uh, there is no a prior understanding that like, you deduce the meaning of the whole from the meaning of the parts because actually the whole can perfectly well induce the meaning of the parts. In fact, we don't specify the meanings of the parts. Sometimes we just say process, like box, and we might actually specify the meaning of the whole and the meaning of the parts arises from the meaning of the whole. So a definition, so now I want, so what are useful process theories for our purpose? I say a Schrodinger compositional theory is a possibly generalized process theory such as composition is non-trivial. I mean, the whole cannot be decomposed as the part meaningfully. So we want something like we want something like the tensor product in Hilbert spaces to make our, uh, our theory sufficiently interesting. That's what we call a Schrodinger compositional theory. So 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 it's 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 disjoint from the idea of a, of, of Frege's compositionality because that's that's not what we're interested in. We want something much more thorough, which allows for like uh, bottom-down flows, informations, and things like that. 
And we also want all ingredients to have a clear, meaningful ontological counterpart in reality. We want this process to be real. We don't want them to be like a nodes in a neural net, which we don't even understand what they are. So this is what we call a certain compositional theory. Sometimes you may, however, want to break some bigger chunks down in smaller chunks, and that's what we, that's what we like we did in the X calculus. So that's what we call a Lego compositional theory. Except these are, they're all very fresh definitions. Uh, so what are the upshots? This sort of compositionality really works very well with things which are non Boolean. Like Frege's notion of compositionality got his biggest boost with Montague semantic, but that, 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 that's where it worked really well. But that's a purely Boolean theory of meaning. So everything's about a true and false. There is no, no other notion. So it's completely incompatible with the current machine learning type of techniques in NLP, natural language processing. Uh, Wittgenstein's meaning context is, it fits very well in this frame. You can do top down reasoning from the meaning of the whole to the meaning of uh, the parts. Something very important, which is completely absent in current machine learning AI, is embodiment of systems, which also fits very well in these pictures. And that's why we want real. That's why we want the process to be real. They have to fit in the real world so that we get embodied systems. Uh, right. Let me use my last two, three minutes or so uh, to say something else. So, of course, like so this is just the definition of compositionality, but we still have to formalize this one way or another, which is something I'm going to work on. Now, now one, 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 one practical proof for these diagrams that they're useful is they're currently using quantum computing where they're becoming increasingly prominent within the industry. Uh, another way is basically another experiment we want to do. And we want to show that this formalism actually enables teenagers and maybe younger to do advanced quantum computing. Advanced quantum computing as in things like circuit optimization something which, which is a totally new thing, like, like this, which, which was only recently pioneered. And we, we, we claim that high school kids can actually do that uh, using this diagrammatic formalism. Uh, so we're setting up an experiment now. Uh, one thing we had to do is we had to write a new book. So, I mean, I've been advertising my, my big book, but actually there's a new book coming now with Stefano Gogioso, which is, targeted at younger people. So the pictures you see there are a little bit different than the ones you see here, like the spiders, of course, like the ten, of God, we give them some personality. They actually have eight eyes. You see, they really have eight eyes here. So that's, that's, that's biologically accurate. Uh, so when two spiders meet, uh, they, they, they sort of hug and fuse together. And this is one of the last which, which you get like when spiders interact, when two spiders of the same color meet, they, they punch each other and then they, their arms get fall off or something like that, whatever. That's what happens in spider files. They lose their legs. So that's another rule. And just to see, once, once you got this simple rule of two hours, two, two spiders shaking two hands, you can actually deduce things like properties of quantum complementarity. If I do a Z measurement and then I do an X measurement and then I do a Z measurement, there is no connection anymore between the second Z measurement and the first Z measurement. So that's the sort of basic quantum complementarity, which you can kind of explain, explain easily with the spider formalism. Uh, we do circuits, so circuits look like it. Since, uh, since we can build C not gates with spiders, that's exactly what you see here. And instead of phases as numbers, we kind of used phases of the moon. So you don't even have to know what, I mean, it was kind of sort of a cool thing to just avoid any use of numbers, which we sort of did. So we just used phases of the moon basically. Uh, but, we go as far in this book as proving quantum non locality and, and all these circuit uh, com compression techniques, they're all in the book. It's not, 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 not 900 pages, it's like huge, huge font, huge pictures, it's about 140 pages. I mean, in a small font, you could get this in 40 pages probably. So, it, it's, so it's a thin little book. Let, so, okay, Stefano and I, we wrote the book. Uh, then what Alex Hissinger and I did is we set, a, we set exam questions from the Oxford exam, from the postgraduate Oxford exam, from people taking our book. And then with the help of IBM, and that's now underway, uh, Abe and his team, like that's the Kiskit team very much, uh, the Kiskit promotion team, they are now like using their networks to actually test this exam on, on a large group of uh, students and see whether they effectively can solve these exam grade questions. And then Selma is an education experiment. She's uh, expert. She's, she will be analyzing the data. So that's now ongoing. That's now ongoing. Uh, uh, right. So you'll hear about that soon, hopefully, uh, and, and, and positively. 
uh, Caesar start with Schrodinger, I walk to end with Schrodinger. So that's actually, that's Schrodinger's grandson. That's Schrodinger, because Schrodinger is not around anymore. That's Schrodinger's grandson feeding my daughter. For those who don't know who it is, it's Terry Rudolph. Terry Rudolph is now developing uh, optical quantum computers at Psi Quantum. So he's the main scientist at Psi Quantum, developing the optical quantum computers. And uh, I mean, here he's trying to sort of be nice to my daughter and, and, and give her food. But when my, I asked my daughter, what's the best book? Terry's book, Terry was a book, Q, Q for Quantum. It's actually a very nice book, the little one. And then our book, like, the, the choice was obviously made very easily. Uh, Anyway, so if you want to hear more about what happens with this experiment and lots of other stuff, then you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I started tweeting pretty much when the pandemic started. So that's where I ended. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for your uh, nice lecture and very stylish uh, slides, Bob. And uh, folks, do you have any question? I see some questions. Uh, let me see. Oh, well, meanwhile, I have a question about the, uh, the possible relation between uh, paraconsistent logics and uh, quantum superpositions. I know that Walter uh, Carnelia has some papers on that. You already mentioned the intuitionistic logic in the uh, Early, early parts of your uh, talk, uh, I would like to know whether you have uh, taken any look onto the, into the topic or not. Uh, I mean, this is probably the sort of question that, that, that you may want to ask to John Harding, but um, so, so, so what, what one of the, I mean, the general problem, so, so my background was mostly in quantum logic and uh, uh, in some way, quantum logic is closely connected to intuitionistic logic. I once wrote a paper like quantum logic in intuitionistic perspective. So that, that kind of puts the relationship between quantum logic and intuitionistic logic, which I think is worth knowing, because if you remember the Burke of Neumann, the, the Neumann statement, they thought they were going in opposite directions, uh, but they're not. Now, I know there are connections between intuitionistic logic and paraconsistent logic, but I'm not, a, so there may be actually a connection there too. But um, I, can't, I can't sort of give a crisp answer there. So that what I was referring to, the, the, the intuitionistic and, and then quantum logic, you find in paper, quantum logic and intuitionistic perspective, which is from 99, I think, or something like that for myself. And then I know that there are connections between intuitionistic and paraconsistent. And that could actually link the, the two together, as you're asking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a follow-up, uh, um, so so you you are approaching the quantum logic from the topos theoretic app um, view, I guess. Uh, you know, somehow it, as as intuitionistic logic is uh, in close connection with topos theory, and so uh, yes, do you have yes, that, that, that the answer the end, I think you want to read something that should have been published, but he didn't do it. Uh, Dan Marsden, Dan Marsden did the MSc at Oxford. He compared uh -huh. all these different topos approaches and also my embedding of quantum logic and intuitionistic logic, because in a way it's the same thing. Once you embed quantum logic in, a, in, in, in intuitionistic logic, you can use that as the, as the uh, subject qualifier in your topos, right? That's the way you can think of it. And he has a very nice yep. thesis where he compares all these different frameworks and the intuitionistic, all the intuitionistic lo logic comes in there. So that's Dan Marsden, an MSc thesis. So if you Google my Oxford University page, there is a link to lots and lots of PhD and MSc thesis from former students. And Dan Marsden is there as well. I don't, he should have published that stuff. It's really nice stuff, but he, he never really published it, but it's available online on this page of PhD thesis and MSc thesis, which are still have at the university. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Another question. Uh, well, uh, Emmanuel uh, asked, ask, uh, does diagrammatic uh, theory explain also classical theory? And can be applied uh, for so-called hybrid quantum classical systems? Yes, exactly. So this is happening here. Huh? Let me go back. This slide is still visible, yeah? This is happening here. So the thick wires you see here, the thick wires you see here is quantum. All the thin wires you see here is classical. 
So in something like uh, this, the example of uh, uh, proving non-locality, a la Mermin, uh, so basically what you do there is you take some quantum processes, which you see these stick things here, you take GHG state, you measure them, you get classical data, then you post-process the classical data. Basically what you do is you measure parity. And so what you see here on top, these single wires on top of the thick wires, that's processing the classical data on top of the quantum data. So if you go to our book, you can find descriptions of things like measurement-based quantum computing, fully diagrammatic. So measurement-based quantum computing is you measure, and then you do classical processing depending on your outcome, and then decide on the basis of this classical processing what your next measurement should be. And that's a model of computation, and it's like very interactive, and you can find in our book a description of that. You don't even have to go to our book. You find this in papers, I think, by Ross Duncan, or maybe he doesn't do classical processing. And definitely in our book, you find this. And you, you've, that's the whole idea of these spiders to actually capture classical classicality besides quantum. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Wow. Okay, another question just popped up. Uh, uh, Aqua says that, uh, sorry if my question is a bit, a bit away from what you are presenting. May I know what is the role of Hop up, hop algebra. Very good question. Very good question. Very good question. So basically, but it's very subtle. So basically, the the bialgebras which I showed earlier, like I'm actually looking at the questions here too, so I knew what was coming. The bialgebras which I showed earlier, where is that? Like here, this is a generalized bialgebra law. Uh, so when you have a Hopf algebra, it's always a bialgebra, so it satisfies the equation. Now, in usual bialgebra, you don't have these spider equations. You use monoids and commonoids. I, I assume you understand that language, but you don't have this full Frobenius spider algebra. Now, when you have this full spider algebra, like here, then your bialgebra is automatically a Hopf algebra. So, so ZX algebra, ZX calculus is a Hopf algebra, but it has more. Now you ask about the antipode. The antipode for qubits specifically is identity, which is a little bit crazy. So the antipode is trivial. Now you may want to look into uh, some recent papers by Sean Majit, Sean Majit, as you probably know, is one of, one of the biggest names in uh, quantum algebra. So he recently has written, I think one may actually be on the art, a new one may actually be on the art today, but he recently wrote a paper on, on ZX calculus and he kind of explains some connections. And then there are papers like by Ross Duncan, like uh, how you can think of ZX calculus as two interacting Hopf algebras. And there are papers by so Sobotvinsky, how you can think of them as two interacting bialgebras, who together form Hopf algebra. So, so the structure of ZX is much richer than a Hopf algebra, but there are ways you can take a Hopf algebra and then say, then add stuff and then say, okay, now you got ZX calculus. So that was a very good question. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much again for your uh, nice talk. And we will be, uh, there will be another talk of Bob tomorrow. And uh, so we say goodbye for now. And we say hello to, to our next guest. Uh, hello, Benu. And uh, I leave the stage for my friend uh, Chu to uh, host the next talk.